guys huge podcast alert uh you got ked here doing an interview this guy i mean one of my all-time favorite hard nose like i'm gonna get in your face don't care about a guy played 336 games the nhl had six goals that's six more than i have uh 774 penalty penalty minutes that's just nhl he had 337 one year in albany new york just 40 minutes south of me welcome to the podcast cam jansen what's up brother so you're upstate new york Saratoga Springs. Yeah, I love it up there, dude. Well, Kate and I, my wife, always talk about that if we made a ton of money, a ton of money, we'd buy a cool place on Lake George up there, oh. dude, because we love the seasons and we love the hillside. Going up there and playing in the minors and shit, going up to all the, the different, uh, uh, you know, Binghamton when you, when you cruise right. around up there. Although the cities aren't great. But if you had a ton of money, we would live on Lake George. So I like where you're at, homeboy. Well, I love cool. that you're even saying that. And we're going to get into it because I'm pretty sure that you roomed with the Robinsons at some point. I think we'll kind of get yeah. into that. The yeah, I did. On, just yeah. a small connection. But before we kind of get into this, let's just do kind of quick. Let's talk about your hockey career, how it started. When did you start playing hockey? You're from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm sure back when you were growing up, the hockey wasn't huge there. Uh, so yeah, just hop into it. Like what, what attracted you to the game and who was like a player that like growing up, you're like, fuck, I love that guy. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, dude. So the Cardinals are huge here. Hockey's not big. My parents had nothing to do with hockey, but they love the blues and the blues were cool. And there's fighting and aggressiveness. I played every single sport in a book and I was really, I was a really good athlete. And my dad take me everywhere. I'd hit guys in soccer, but I'd score goals in soccer. And we're like, what else can you do? Then my parents got me into roller hockey. But the reason why I got into hockey and wanted that aspect is my parents would take me to Cardinals games and I'd walk around like this, like, uh, what, like, what are we doing? Like, Oh, what happened? Uh, but then they take me to hockey games and they take me right out on the glass. And then Tony Twist would motherfuck somebody so fucking bad and take his fucking tarp off. Like, I'm the bad motherfucker. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I, I want to be you. I want to be you. And then you got Holly cruising around scoring fucking 80. Like, then you got Chaser doing his shit. And then you meet the guys and they're cool. And then, like, just like, I'm like, I'm into it. So my dad got me into uh, roller hockey. And I started playing roller hockey and skating in parks and roller hockey in the basement and shooting pucks in the basement. And then I got to learn to play. And then I made another team right off the bat. And then I played triple A three years into my hockey career. I started playing amateur blues and it took off from there. What's, what's the adjustment from roller hockey to ice hockey a little bit difficult for you? Was it just kind of like, all right, same, same concept. Just got to figure this out. No, I, so I, my, I have an older brother. So I played up two years in house. Right when I started ice hockey, I got into it right away. And I was able to stop and do my shit because I played roller hockey. So I'm like, okay, I get it. I figured it out. And so I was always with older guys. And then I, wa then I wanted to be mean. And I was like a little kid. I didn't go through fucking puberty yet. And I'm like, I want to kill guys. <laughs> and I fucking like go and I show off to my old my butt my brother's older buddies and hit guys and fucking do this. And then be in the basement and all my brother's buddies would come over and we'd fight each other and shit. And so that's how you like I became confident. And then I just became good at it. And then I'm like killing guys and all of a sudden in scoring goals. And then all of a sudden in, in AAA, like you're scoring goals. And all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm going to be in psycho mode. And I'm going to go murder a kid. And I go do that. And then you score a goal and I penalty kill and you do that. <laughs> and then you just get people see you. And all of a sudden you're like, who's this kid? So th that's how it, it all happens. You just move from boom, boom, boom. But I became an athlete playing other sports. That's the key. Okay. All right. I, I like that. And I like the fact that you're talking about like killing kids and hitting kids because I know. It, 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 okay. Time out. I shouldn't say murder and kill. Yeah. Just take that lightly. Like, yeah, I, 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 I mean. but, but that was my, I was, cr you're crazy then. Like you're a psycho at that age. Like I'm like, I wanted to like catch them clean and just stick them and then know that like, I'll do that to all you guys. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wasn't a boy. I wasn't big. So I needed to prove that. That I could hit guys. So when I say that, that's just an exaggeration of me wanting to really catch a guy hard. No, a hundred percent. What what I was trying to say is like that brought a different element to the kids who are just out there scoring goals. And I'm especially at like a youth hockey stage when you're watching a guy go out there that can't just score goals, but is going out there and burying people. And he's like the alpha on the ice, man. Yeah. You're right. People are gonna look. They're like, who the fuck? Oh, who is this kid? Like, what exactly. the fuck? Who is? What the fuck is he doing? 
like parents are going crazy and shit. <laughs> and my dad had to deal with it, and there, and then, but that catches attention, right? Well, right. He, has three, he already has three goals. Yeah, he has three goals, and then and now he's got two kids down, and then the parents go nuts, and then your dad has to like stand by himself, and like just like pace, like just like don't look at it, you know, like it's just fucking good. That's what you do, you know. Yeah, no one no, knew who the fuck we were. Like you had to prove yourself. So you uh you went the junior route. You went to the OHL. Um, well, you went to NHL and then OHL. Was college ever an option? Was that ever like something? I mean, look, I, like where I could maybe go this? Like, why'd you do the junior route? To believe, believe it or not, and I, I see this on my radio show, and I always like talk how I'm not educated sure. by any means because I'm I'm really not. But my mom and dad listen to everything I do, and they listen to my radio show every single day. And my mom just says, Stop saying that. Tell <laughs> people that you made good grades until yeah. your ninth grade. And then you were a psychopath because you wanted to go play hockey and do this thing and you stopped having good grades. So I, I was a good student. It just like at, at that age, I'm like, I just want to go. I know where I'm at. Even at that young age, I was so confident that I was going to make it because you have all these like different little, they call them uh, family advisors, but they're agents and they're, they're at different tournaments. And they're like, oh my God, he's going to make it. You're going to get drafted in the OHL. He's going to do this. So I was just like, yeah, you're right. I am. And so I mean, just stop going to school and just playing and working and oh god, not working, but like just kind of partying a little bit. I just knew what I was going to do, but I was working hard to get there too. So it, it, it was a crazy lifestyle, man. To be completely honest with you, was was it was it tough going to the OHL, being away from your family? Man, dude, <laughs> I'm sure you it's not good times. Like, it's, 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 I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So leaving my family, I am so close to them and I love them. They li- they're next to me right now. I live right next to them, although we're moving into our kind of dream home, which is great. But I'm very close to my family. If I didn't have them, I'd be fucked. And that's the bottom line. And if kids don't have a daddy, if they make it, then it's extra. Because my mom and dad, oh, God, I put them through hell and they stuck with me. But leaving them was nerve wracking. And I live with an 85-year-old couple, but I still, but I became really, for the first time in my life, where I had to prove to people when I was young, like I'm a hockey player. And they're like, what? You're from Eureka, Missouri. What does that mean? And now I'm in Windsor, Ontario and I'm fucking shit kicking guys. And I'm taking my Jersey off and flexing to people. Like, and all of a sudden you became unbelievably popular like that for the first time in your life, you have like people writing you notes and taking you and you can do whatever you want. And you're like, Oh my God. Like you're kind of feel like a little superstar in your own little bubble. And so, yeah, I missed them. Because some nights are tough, but for the majority, like you're on cloud nine. So <laughs> I wanted to show off to Pete. So my buddies would come up and shit and visit me. Yeah. And I just wanted to show off the lifestyle we were living, dude. That's crazy. Was the 85 year old couple a little rattled that <laughs> you were the guy living with them? What were they-, they, they became obsessed with me, dude. It was very <laughs> bizarre. They watched me sleep and shit. And like fucking, I'd have to tell them. I'd be like, I'm going to go to a movie theater tonight. Eh. Meanwhile, like me and my buddies are fucking partying and hanging out with girls and 40 year old women and psycho shit at 17 years old. And, and they're like, Oh, how was the movie? I'm like, Oh, it was good. Like, Oh God, we had no, they, we had no, no, no one did like, they know that you're there for three years at that time and you're gone. And if you're good and you get drafted and you sign, like I did, they have no control over you. Like there's a nun. And so you just do what the fuck you want. And we did. And it was psycho. And it was awesome. But I figured it out. Absolutely. And you ended up getting drafted in the NHL, man. Uh, let's see here. Fourth round to the Devils. What, I mean, take me through that. Like, how do you find out? Do you remember exactly where you were? And, like, what was the emotion? Who was your Hell first? Hell yeah. Like, Hell get, yeah. bring down that story. Because that feeling must be. It gives me chills. And I wasn't even drafted. So no one, <laughs> no one even knows in St. Louis that much. Like not, no, I don't even know if there's any guys before me that even got drafted. Like the have there been? I don't fucking know. Maybe not. I'm not on the first one ever, but like this just doesn't happen. But my age is like, <laughs> you're getting drafted. And I'm like, okay. I'm like what rounds two to four. I'm like, okay. So I go to Toronto. It's in Toronto. My family's there. My billet family, everybody's there. That's awesome. And and we're all excited. We know somebody's going to grab me. Like, it's going to happen. I was killing guys. I was scoring goals. Not many, but, like, I was – you're getting drafted at right. that point. Like, you just know. And so, I'm like, we do all the, the testing and go through all the, the uh, interviews with all the teams and stuff like that. And so, we're sitting there. First two rounds go, fine. Third round goes, 
and it comes to New Jersey Devils, which I had a great meeting with, excuse me, Lou Lamarillo, who I love, who I love more than anything in the world besides my family. He is my second father. I love that man so goddamn much. And if anybody ever fucking bashes him for anything, I know he has to do business. He was so goddamn good to me. I'll do anything for that guy. Uh, anyway, so I knew that they were going to, I knew that they had big time interests. Lou knew that he had something with me. I was tough. He could control me. He knew I'd do anything for the team kind of shit. Yeah. So third round comes by and the devils are up and they go from the Windsor Spitfires and me and my dad get up like, <gasps> and I got cigarette holes in my fucking suit. We're, you know, we want money. And we, yeah. My parents were fucking dead broke at this time, big time. So we get up like, fuck yeah. And the people next to us were Aaron Niddle and his family. And they play with me in Windsor too, who never made it, who I love by the way, but he never made it. And all of a sudden they go, Aaron Niddle. We're like, Oh, oh, oh. And we, and then we slapped hands with Aaron. Yeah. And Quick. it was so <laughs> depressing. <laughs> And so he gets drafted, and then the fourth round comes, and the Devils come again. And everybody else gets up, and they shake hands with their family, like, hi, we're professional. Well, me and my dad get up, and we fucking knew it. And we're like, fuck yeah, get on with this shit. And we come down there, and Lou Lamarillo comes up to me and goes, you look like a hockey player. And I go, you damn right. And I, shake, I, I, I was just so awesome, man. My mom and dad have no idea what the fuck they're doing. We're like, eh. And so they stayed there. I come home to my house. They stay in Detroit. I get a flight home because I made my agent pay for me to come home early. So I have a party at my house. I have a fucking party in my house. My future wife was there at the time who was a Rams cheerleader, baddest bitch in school. Just like when you walk past her in school, like I'd be like, ah, I'm a loser. Like that kind of thing. <laughs> like you're a fucking loser. Like, uh, and no comp. But she was there that night. And I was bragging to her so bad about what I was going to do. And she kind of like, I remember her rolling her eyes and I just like, oh, okay. And we didn't talk for like seven years. And then all of a sudden we get married and it's just so funny how that works. But that night cops come to my house. My dad tells them my brother just got drafted to the devils. They're like, oh, okay. Enjoy yourself. It was like, I mean, uh, just like, it's just a fair in my own little bubble. It's a fairy tale. In my own little bubble, it's a fairy tale. I'm, you're not Matthew fucking McConaughey. You're not in my own little Eureka St. Louis bubble. You live in a fairy tale, and that's how it was. I mean, that's an unbelievable story, and the, and the fact that your wife was there, man, I, you did good, by the way. Rams cheerleader, casual, whatever. Well, no, she wasn't nothing to do with me. Okay, at the time. Okay, let's be honest. <laughs> I was a fucking dipshit. I was a fucking dipshit. I had to figure shit out and figure my shit out, and then we got engaged and married okay so let's just get that straight i was a fucking psychopath <laughs> come on it ended up working out right but yeah you gotta figure shit you gotta change you gotta you got you gotta you can't live that high you just gotta balance your shit man it's just that simple so you're drafted by the devils you end up going to the albany river rats arguably probably one of my favorite sets of jerseys by the way i, I wish those things were still around those were unreal um, your first year, you put up 337 penalty minutes. I don't know if it was the first year or when you were living with the Robinsons, but I, that I, was it. No, that was the 04 lockout. That was when that league was a fucking shit kicking us motherfuckers in the league. That was the toughest league ever to exist in life besides the seventies and shit like that. Yeah. That year was so tough. They had monsters, three or four monsters, Sugden, Jablonski. Oh, fucking Morasty, fucking Morasty. the baddest motherfucks. Holt Nor, Morgratton, baddest motherfuckers to ever live besides the old school cats. Right. And all in one league because they, they were able to play. And so I would have won the league in a goddamn penalty minutes, but my boy Brian McGratton kept getting 10 minute misconducts <laughs> because he chirped the fucking refs. And I, tur I love him. He's the coolest cat in the world. Oh, my God, Brian. I love that man to death. Tougher than dog shit. But he would just get 10 minutes, and he'd get his penalty minutes racked up. He had 551, I think. But we both had, like, 45 fighting majors. I was fighting everybody. Yeah, you don't fuck. get up good anymore. Jesus, man. I didn't give a fuck. I had to, though. I'm like, I'll go all you guys. Like, I don't give a I You have to. I was killing guys in juniors. But you're beating up guys that are your age and maybe younger than yeah. you. And now you're going against 35-year-old badass men that yeah. are fucking warriors. And then once you go against them, you're like, yeah, now you got your confidence. Yep. Yeah. Now, it seems like you've always had that, like, I'm going to hit you mentality. Has there ever been a guy that you fought on the ice where, like, when you drop the gloves and you look across and you're like, oh, shit. 
Or are you just like, I don't care. Every, I'm, I hit everybody and they all fall the same. Was there ever yeah. a time where you're like, I'm no, going to no. off a little bit more than I could chew? Let me explain. My hitting career took me over the edge. My body checking career. Yep. That's what makes me scarier than anything. Because there's a lot of guys that know how to rock you, but they can't back it up and go toe to toe with you for right. two and a half minutes. I can, even at 5'11. I was unbelievable at hitting guys. And that's what kept me in the NHL. So even if a guy could beat me up, I knew if he had the puck on the wall, I'm going to hit you so hard yeah. to a point where I could hurt you yeah. worse than you could hurt me in a fight because I'm strong enough to take care of you, even if you're uh, Steve McIntyre. Although, right. God, he's so horrifying. <laughs> but you get my drift. So, yeah. And you can't avoid hits. If you have that puck on the wall, I'm going to get you. And that's what made me terrifying. But then they're like, okay, I'm going to fight him, but he's got – he might not knock me out because he's 5'11 I and mean, I'm 6'6, six, six, but I'm going to fight you for two and a half minutes. And so it's like, I'm just a fucking pain in the ass. And then I'm going to catch you with your head down and hurt you that way. Yeah. That's what makes you scary is being a hitter. But most guys hit and they don't know how to fight, but I kind of did both. Yeah. No, and that's the one but thing. But that's it because I didn't score. But, yeah, yeah, but that's the one thing I respect about you too because like, You'd back it up. You know what I mean? Like, if, if you did hit somebody and somebody came at you, there was never a moment, at least well, yeah. from you, where you were like, oh, I don't want to do this. You'd be like, okay, let's go. And that's okay. something that – and I'm a diehard Rangers fan, man. Like, grew up 94 is when I started watching it. Like, and I remember I hated you, but I I couldn't not respect you because, like, you were a guy that if you were on my team, you would have been my favorite fucking player because yeah. you would back it up. And, that, and that's something – you, sometimes you don't see you see players like a uh, uh, Matt Cook throughout the years or, or guys that kind of do shady shit and then when you have to drop the gloves they don't do it. That was never a question for you. And, and yeah, I, I know. But on the other hand, Matt Cook was a better player, so you kind of have to like adjust that. But on the other hand, what makes you good is what you do with the fans. And I'll give you an example of what I did. I was obsessed with making the fans happy. Like honestly, like I feed off of that, and I still do with a podcast. Right. With everything. That's why I do this shit with people because I just kind of know how the game works. Now, there's a million people that invite me to do podcasts. I, I can't even answer them. I keep my DMs open. But if you're good with the fans, they'll love you forever. I've seen guys that made 50 million bucks and they don't want to come back to St. Louis because they just didn't do good. Or they're just like, eh, I wouldn't, that would suck for me. I go back to Jersey. Like I did, I remember getting hurt one time and I went to Lou Row and I go, I want to do autograph session. I know I'm out for six months. I'm 22 years old. I have, I, I got money. I got shit. I got a little bit of fame. I can do what I want. But I told Lou, I go, can you set up autograph sessions for me for free? I don't give a fuck. And I'll just want to hang out with fans and sign autographs. And he did that. And I every all the six months I was hurt when I ripped my shoulder out, I did autograph sessions like fucking like three times a week. At different places, and then you build up this like thing, and then you get back on the ice, and you go fucking bring it, and they just love you. So, and I and I fucked up a couple of times where like they could, but they get you because they know you now because you're there. So, no, and, that's and, a, that's what people need. Fan, uh, players need to know. Like yeah, you need to be yeah, build up your fan base. Well, stuff like that goes a long way from a fan too, right? Like if I'm just at the rink and I see Cam dance, I'm 100 percent going to stop by and, and yeah. Try. Abs you know? Absolutely. And I'm going to talk to you like I I've known you for 12 years. Exactly. Exactly. That's what you do. Yep. yep. And, I, and guys get annoying and they get touchy feely. More guys than girls. Guys get touchy feely. <laughs> and it's like, eh, and then my wife will be like, get this fucking guy. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. And so you got to deal with that shit and that's fine. But I'd rather it be like that than they hate you because you're a dick, because you think you're cool or whatever. I don't know. So, don't so. Know. When you were playing for Albany, what were like the spots that you guys were hanging out at? Oh Jesus! Oh fuck! I you mean, remember that was a, it was a lot. I mean, ago. Albany's different because look, look, you party when you're in a show, but you do party in Albany, but it's just different in the minors than it is when you're cruising in NHL, right? Because yeah. we're partying and you're not partying in different uh, cities in, in the minors. You're partying in, in cities in, in NHL. Right. Because you're in Montreal, you're in Chicago. You're like, like how can I not go out tonight? <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, but in, in Albany and you go to Binghamton, and you're like, I'm not going out tonight because there's nothing to do. Let's just chill in my room or watch football or whatever. You know, so it's like the, the lifestyle is different. Your mindset's different in the minors, but in the NHL, 
you're like, and you're young and you're single, you're like, what am I doing tonight? Let's let's go. Because I know I could suck up what the fuck I need to do the next day. So you spent two years with the uh, with the River Rats. You get called up to the Devils. What was the? Uh, what was that? I'm sure that's probably just like the draft experience memory for you. Like what what was it like getting that phone call where you're like, okay, it's I cool. was in <clears throat> I was in a hotel room. With my parents they were visiting awesome. me, awesome. and uh, you know we were watching um, we we're watching the Devils, the Big Devils play the Rangers in the hotel and we had pizza and I had an awesome game that night against Springfield where I fought a guy, I fucking caught him. I got an assist. I killed, I, ro- I shouldn't say kill. I rocked a couple guys. Just put a show on fucking parents there. My mom and dad are, I'm going to go psycho and be a fucking man. You know, you got, you just that's what you do. So we're in the, we're in the hotel and we're eating pizza and this whole Ryan Hallway guy on the Rangers is running guys yeah. and the devils played the back to back that night or the next day. And he's running guys and he's making a scene. And my dad looks at me and goes, you're getting called up tomorrow. I go, huh, okay. He goes, you're getting called up tomorrow. I'm like, okay. Two, Shut second, up, two no seconds way. later, two, not, not four seconds, two seconds later, Robbie Fator calls and goes, cam. I go, Hey, my phone rings. Hey, it's Robbie Fedor. <laughs> hey. And he goes, uh, you're not playing tomorrow. I go, Robbie, fuck. I go, I just fucking fought. I got in the what, what? And he goes, shut the fuck up. He goes, you're not playing because you got called up to play against the Rangers and MSG. Go get them or oh, something like fuck. So, I mean, like this, this is like ridiculous shit that happened to me. My parents are right there. My dad called it. They follow me down. They, we, I'm calling everybody on the way down to New York. It was actually Jersey. We had to go to a hotel. All the guys were in the hotel. The guys chirped me right when I got there because I had sweatpants on. Oh, fuck. And so it just was awesome. It's, it's fairy tale shit that in my own bubble, it is. Okay, let's get it right. I'm not, again, in my own little bubble, this is fairy tale shit. Mm-hmm. And that's how it went down. It's, it's just awesome. I, I, I don't know. It all works. If you work hard, man, shit works out, dude. <laughs> but don't get me wrong. If you do bad shit, Bad shit happens, okay? Because that certainly happened too. All right, and not, not everything was fucking rainbows, just so you know. I mean, but that, it, it, this, at this point, it was. So your first game in the NHL is against New Jersey Rangers rivalry night. Like, I th- what was it like getting ready for the game? Like, you're in the locker room, you you, you made it, or you had the shakes a little bit. Like, I don't even remember, man. To be complete, I don't even fucking remember the, when I was in the locker room. I don't remember the ride over there. I remember certain spurts of things. Here's what I do remember. My first shift, Darius Kasparaitis fucking laid me out. And I was so mad <laughs> because I was never used to anybody hitting me without them being like, oh, God. But Darius right. Kasparaitis didn't give a fuck who I was. He didn't even know who I was. So I never in years have gotten hit like that where – People aren't like, the whole rink's like, what the fuck? Now I'm like, what? So I get the puck in, whatever, get off. And then I catch that mother who I love, Darius Casper. I love him. Had him on a podcast. He is such an awesome guy. If I called him right now and said, dude, I'm going to fucking jam, he'd be there. Like, I don't even know him that well. That's how cool he is. Anyway, he rocks me the next shift. Uh, he comes around. I get the pucks in deep. He comes around and I get my groove, baby. Where I'm gonna get him, and I stick that motherfucker right behind him. That bam, boom, they get crying, like fucking, and I do this, get the, you know, keep the puck alive, you know. That's how you do it. So it was cool, man. I got the puck out of the zone a couple times. I only played like three minutes, probably, but I rocked him, fucking got him. And then I know all Lou and everybody was like, eh, okay, that's he's got it. He could <laughs> he could find his way into what we want him to do. Yeah, that's the kid. I mean, dude, what, what an experience. First game. Bears Cass Bryce, hell of a name, by the way. I He's mean, awesome. He was a hell of a hockey player. Yeah. Too. He really was. I, one of my favorites. I love uh, him. Do you remember your first your first fight in the NHL, who that was up against? Oh, I had preseason fight. God, I was fighting so much, dude, so it didn't. <laughs> like, I can't, fuck. I mean, it's like I, I had like 15 preseason fights and then like everything. Um I know I, I I think I won like 10 in a row right off the bat. Then you lose some, okay? Yeah. It always comes back around like a boomerang, homie. <laughs> just so you know. Yeah. It's not that bright. Like, but I won like 10 in a row because we're playing like Florida and we're playing guys that I, it just worked out perfect for me to beat up the guys I needed to to get your name off the bat, right? Mm-hmm. So it was like, look, God rest his soul, Monador. Yep. 
I oh God, I piss pumped him. God rest his soul. And he had a tough time, but like he kept trying to fight me because I'd run guys and he had to stick up for it because they had no other tough guys. So they fucked him on that. And then I'd fight like Erskine and I'd do good against Big John Erskine. And then I'd like kiss rock guys and get the crowd going crazy in Jersey. And, you know, and then it was good with the fan. And so I just I found my groove, man. So they couldn't send me down. What was, it, what was it like going in the locker room? I mean, you guys had the Marty Brodeur, Brian Rafalfi, Scott, I mean, Scotty. Uh, get back. Look, and like, I was, I was so out of touch, man, dude. I was sort of touch. I thought everything was about me. You're in juniors. It's all about you. Even in the minors that year in 04, like right with the torque, it's always about, I was a draft pick. I was signed. I was doing good. Like it's about you. Then you get there. And you're the lowest of the totem pole, homie. And if you act like you're, and I was loud, and I was beating guys up, and I was getting popularity and attention, and and then you kind of get, and then the guys have to bring you down, and they're making fucking ten million a year, and you're a fucking fourth line plug, although popular, but you're a, just shut the fuck up, Cam. And so I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, no, I'm gonna hang out with all the older guys. So I forced myself to hang out with the older guys. And we all hung out, and then they chirped me so bad, but that's good. And I learned to be like witty with them, you know. And like, like fuck, that. it's just like a learning curve. And I'm like, no, Cam, you're you just learn to be a man and to like know your place and to be a warrior and to be funny and to be witty. It's just fuck, it's 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 college, and it. I learned so much from playing with older guys that are successful and different personalities that are witty and funny. I learned so much to where it would cost somebody to learn that $15 million in, in college. Does that make sense? No, hundred percent. Even you're, at you're, goddamn Harvard. I don't give a fuck the, the, the shit you learn from. There's so many different people and there. It's all, uh, it's crazy how I can't even explain it. So just so you know, life lessons, man. And oh my God. On unreal, and so playing with Marty Brodeur, man, arguably the best goaltender to ever put on the pads. Uh, what was it like playing with a guy like that? I mean, that, we'll talk about a name and talk yeah. about the influence that he had on the game. There's so many goalies nowadays. You ask who their favorite goalie was growing up. Marty Brodeur is normally, if, if it's not him, it's either Hotchick or Watt. Like those are the three goalies growing up. What well, I mean, was it was it kind of the shit that you saw in practice and in games? Like were there moments where you're like, how the fuck is this guy doing it? Yeah, I, yeah, dude. You know what? I became buddies with him right off the bat. I told you I'd like sneak my way into the older crowd. I'd sit next to him on a plane, like a like a little weirdo. Like <laughs> no, but he was like, okay. And then we became buddies. That's what you fucking do. Why the fuck would I hang out with the young kids? What are right. they gonna bring to the table? Nothing. I want to hang out with the best of the best, dude. And I just knew to do that. No one told me to do that. I was like, no, why am I sitting in the front of the plane or the front of the bus when I could spend money basically and play cards with the guys and sit next to marty back there and like hang out with him and make him laugh right. and so we know each other and then we all hang out together and then later on like kate was friends with his wife and like now we're you know yeah like that's what you fucking do marty's awesome dude he's a he's a big dick dude he walks around he's a fucking big dick yeah and when he was in practice like he he would stand on his head and do shit like crazy shit where you're like, I've never seen this before. <laughs> and, you know, and if I came down and scored on him, I'd be like, fuck yeah, you motherfucker. Fuck. He'd be like, I'm gonna fuck <laughs> you. you know, I love that. Like, he was so competitive, man. But he's cool and he parties and he's fun. And like, I can call him right now and he'd answer. That's cool. No, that's, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I know, like that's <laughs> shit. And like, my, Kate could call him right now and he'd answer. Kate could call his wife. Like, like that's cool. No, I yeah. love that. 100%. I can't say that, man. <laughs> so you played two years with the Devils and two years in the AHL with the Lowell Devils. And then you go to St. Louis, man. Hometown. What was that like? What was your first game, first home game in St. Louis like for you? I get the moment you talk about your fairy tale of being your fairy tale. That fairy tale sounds fucking awesome, dude. You have your family surrounded by you, smoking hot wife, drafted by Lou Lamorello. Now you're home in St. Louis, dude. Well, the wife wasn't around then, dude. Well, you I, was, know, I was psycho. This is me being a nutbag. It was too much. It, it was so crazy. My parents couldn't. They, they started going to the games, and they're like, I can't do this anymore because everybody be, Cam, Cam, Cam. And then that guy be like, fuck Cam. And my dad be like, I want to 
I want to, I hate you. Get me out of here. <laughs> yeah. And it's a long drive for them to go home. They're getting older. So I set them up with a big fucking TV, TiVo at the time, and they get to watch. And if I have a fight, they can watch it and they're listening to fucking, you know, whoever, you know, they can listen to the radio and do everything there. I don't need to be fucking downtown by my buddies, though, where I do a story. <laughs> and I bring my fucking buddies. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then put a show on, and we all go, oh, God. I mean, it it became too much to a point where it was a fantasy world. I was still doing my thing. I was caught up in a lot of shit. And I just, I needed to change. Like, although they wouldn't have resigned me anyway. Do it. I wasn't good enough at the time that for Reaver was in here, but it was such an awesome thing. It was so unbelievably awesome, although too much. Yeah. But if they didn't play for the blues, I wouldn't be set up the way I am now. No, because I, I, it became really popular here. And now I get to do a radio show and podcast. Like people know yeah, I can't go to a gas station. My wife's more popular than me. Now. It's crazy. <laughs> and you got to play some pretty awesome people in St. Louis, too. Here's a couple names. One name I definitely want to know about, Paul Correa. Uh, it's absolute stud. Um, Keith Kachuk, Dougie Waite. I think he played with Petroangelo his rookie year. Do you have some stories about these guys? Like, I want to know a little bit more about Paul Korea just because I think you don't really get to hear as much about him. And he wasn't on the Ducks at the time. Obviously, he's on the Blues. But, like, what was it like playing with those players? Even Big Chuck, I'm sure that was awesome. I'll give you two. Petro was great. Fine. He was awesome. He was a young kid. I played him for a while. I love him. I could call Petro right now. Great guy. Paul Korea was fucking awesome, dude. And he, listen, he didn't have to be cool to me. I was living two different lives. I had my own personal life in St. Louis and I had the blues. And then, you know, it's like, and then, you know, he knows he was so fucking cool to me. He respected everything I did. He would talk to me. He would take me to sushi. Like this, like always like interested in what I had to say about things like little things that you just, you pick up. Like he was a superstar, but he was so sweet to me. And my parents would meet him one time. He just, I fucking love him. Like, yeah, he was so annoying to the trainers because he was such a fucking uh, oh God, hypochondriac with <laughs> this and that. I mean, crazy. But he would tip out the trainers like 40 grand and shit, like crazy shit. I love fucking Paul Korea. I want him on my podcast, but he doesn't do that shit. So right. I don't want to bug him anymore, although I do make fun of him. He's an awesome guy. Doesn't drink, doesn't do anything. Perfect body. Will live forever. I love him, sweetheart. Keith and Chuck. Is the funniest man I've ever met in my life. He's the funnest guy I've ever met in my life. He's one of my favorite teammates I've ever had in my life. He is the specialist of all special people in the world. Keith your Chuck, you fucking your gene works. <laughs> and the best athlete in that goddamn family is his daughter, Taryn, by the way. Write that fucking down. He's she could kick shit kick fucking Brady and Matthew at the same time. She's the baddest bitch in the family besides Chantel. Chantel runs the show, but Walt is the coolest guy, man. He was so he I had late, I had old Walt. I had I had old Walt. I had old Walt where he was just so down to earth and just he knew where he was at in his career. He just hung out with the guys. He would be so funny. He would control the locker room. Just the best of the best, man. And, and those kids, I love those kids. They're sweet. So I stick up for that family, dude, because they're the best, dude. That's the bottom line. <laughs> write that, write that fucking down. Everybody <laughs> needs to know. <laughs> so you you play for the Blues four years. You head back to the Devils. Uh, I I guess before we kind of get into your uh, the podcast that you guys have started, like I actually I have two things. Uh, the first thing. I looked this up today. I play hockey on Sundays with Pierre Luc Latorno LeBlanc. And <laughs> yeah. And I, I look, so bitch. Oh my God. And the nicest human Bat, being. Oh my God. Like he is I, awesome. Tell him I said, Hey, by the way, absolutely. Please. Absolutely. Cutest kids in the world. He's a fucking tougher than dog shit. Holy fuck. Awesome. I, guy. I, I looked up one of your fights and, and I made sure I had the time, right? You fought him for two minutes and 40 seconds. Have, have you? I don't know if I've ever heard of a fight lasting that long. Man, he is, dude. He's just bad to the bone. That cat, dude. He was in. 
He's an underrated. I gotta throw him in a mix because I I follow all the like I, I have Facebook. I have all all the shit and I all the tough guys. We all fucking mingle. Yeah, and and we just need to bring him up more because he was so fucking tough and he got buckled a couple of times, but he knocked cats out. <laughs> yeah, God, he had long arms and they fucking reach into you like God damn. He was tougher than shit, and he's a sweetheart. Like he's an like if you met off the ice, like he's a a doll. He's a doll. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, hey, kid, you know, just like, I'm like, fuck, like, I don't know, man. Like, that's those are the guys you got to cherish, man. Like, when you're that crazy and tough, but yet you're that cool off the ice, you got to show respect on that, dude, just so um, you know. And he's, he's just, I remember the first time we played them, it was like a beer league game, and somebody mentioned he was on their team. So I go on like Hockey DB and I look it up, and he has like 400 penalty minutes here, oh. 300 here. And I start oh. thinking, like, this guy's going to be a psycho. Like, I, I'm, I'm like, okay. No, man, he's I, cool. I, I find up with him, I'm like, what's up, man? He goes, you want to go? What? All right, little technical difficulties. Back to Pierre Luc Latorno LeBlanc. Oh, uh, God. I was telling him, I was telling you a story the first time I played him. I, I like looked up his stats and I'm like, holy shit, this guy's probably gonna be a psycho. Line up next to him, and he looks at me and he goes, You wanna go? I'm like, What? And he's like, I'm just fucking with you. And ever yeah. since then, him and I have been like, we're pretty tight. He's a, he's a hell of a guy. He lives in Albany, doesn't he? Yep. Yep. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. he's living the dream. Mm-hmm. He's got a nice little outdoor rink with his kids. I could, he's yeah. gonna be coming on the pod, but that's gonna be awesome. Uh I just wanna hop in a couple more things. Uh your podcast, man. How cool has that been? Uh the guests that you guys have had and just tell our listeners where they can, where they can find this thing. Well, look, you know, podcasts are, everybody has a podcast. Okay. Let's get that straight. So Andy and I don't, we, we were, we don't have any backing from a major corporation, like a bar stool, like a TSN, like a sports net. So we created this on our own and we're able to compete with these guys, not spin chicklets. They're on a different level. We all know that. We love those guys. Yeah. But we're able to compete with everybody else, and and we own it, and it's cool, and it's not an easy thing to fucking do. Okay, like we have to get guests on, we have to we have to pay people to do this and do that. We have to get the people bug us to want to do this. We have to organize the sponsors. We have to monetize different things. It's a lot to it. It's our actually main source of income. To be completely honest with you, to be able to talk to Hall of Famers and learn and be a sponge. And make money off of that. Not like make money off of them, but just like have good sponsors that you take care of. And you just, it's just a cool thing if you're able to really put the work in, man. But you have to put the work in, dude. Like it, like I want to kill Andy once in a while, dude. Like, like, hey, fuck, man. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. But he's great. He's a, he's a, he's a fucking bulldog, man. He gets call, he calls, he does this, he organizes, he takes care of the interns, this, that, and the other. So, it is what it is. It's great, man. It really is. And definitely. If you guys are listening, check it out. The Cam and Strick podcast. Before I let you go, just some random questions I uh, I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Um, if you weren't a hockey player, what do you think you would have been? Probably military. Military? Yeah, I think so. And it's easy to say that. And I don't want to be – look, military buys are the baddest motherfuckers in the oh, world, yeah. dude. Yeah. And I know a ton of – I'm from Eureka, Missouri, brother. That's fucking military heaven. I know all these cats – and they're fucking shit kickers, and they're better than anybody that I've ever played with or any of that, and they've been through hell. So for me to say I'm in the military, like, take that, like, with a fucking grain of salt, please. Yeah, but no. I also, I, I think I would have done that. I mean, I don't know. I probably would have been military, man. Like, honestly. Okay. I, I probably would have been the fucking Marines. I respect that. Yeah, well, I think so. War movie? Platoon's badass. Fuck it. You know, I like glory because it makes me cry at the end. Um, you know, I like uh I like the the uh, show Rome. I like old school shit. I like mil- I like old um I like uh you know Renaissance era, I like castle, I like um you know King Henry the Eighth. You know, I, I just I'm I'm obs- I, we played over in, in, in Europe, so I, I'm obsessed with like European history and shit right. like that. But I educate myself. So I'm still like, like I, you just learn, you know, like, you know, no, I didn't have a really smart guy tell me what to do. Like here, here's about King. No, I'm like, I just read about it. And so I, I have a pretty good grip on history and shit like that. And I'm obsessed with it. All right. That's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to your 10 year old self? Oh God. 
Um, be fearless. Watch out for painkillers. Be sweet to girls. Don't be fru. You don't have to be frugal. Take care of people with your money, but understand money. Um, and that's probably it. Take care of your mom and dad. Those are all good lessons, though. You know, what I mean, those I are know. the earth lessons as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. those are like from the heart. Thing, the one thing I like about you is like. I feel like you're, you are like one of us. Like you're just a, like a down home, genuine dude who loves his family. But like, I, I don't know. I just, I love, I love that about you. And then I guess that my last question, if you could pick three people dead or alive to sit down with and have a nice dinner, uh, who, who are you, uh, who are you sharing a table with? Let me change that. Who am I going to golf with? <laughs> Let's see. Eddie Vedder, Charles Barkley, Elon Musk. Maybe Joe Rogan, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, so they can go back and forth with each other and just be funny. <laughs> I want big boys next to me, and I want to pick all their fucking brains. Yeah, that's what the fuck I want. I love that answer too, man. Well, yeah. Cam, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a pleasure. I mean, you lived up to everything that I, I was hoping it was going to be. Thank you for being so open and honest, and just keep doing your shit, man. I, I mean, I I know I root for you. All the guys root for you, so. Uh, and and thanks for the impact on the league, dude. There, there's few yeah. fighters, tough guys that have come across that like you remember years after. You're definitely one of them. And I appreciate, appreciate that, dude. Appreciate that, man. Seriously, I gotta go watch the Blues game now, baby. Oh, yeah. I gotta write shit down. I gotta do my radio show in the morning. You know how that goes. Go Blues. Thanks, Cam. Appreciate it, man. See you, homie. Be cool. See you, buddy. Awesome. Thanks, dude. No problem, buddy.